Wing Soars, and I'm here again for another um, episode of Agenda Item. With me is Tim Thompson, our town planner, and we take a few minutes each month to talk to you about what's coming up in the planning board agenda. This week, we this month, I mean, we missed a meeting. We did. Uh, for the second time this year, uh, we did not receive any new applications for our uh, May 5th meeting, uh, so that meeting was canceled. So our only meeting this month will be the upcoming meeting on May 12th. Okay, and I see we have plenty on the administrative board work side. We of do. Uh, continuing what seems to be a theme given the uh, state of the economy, we have uh, several extension requests uh, from uh, a, a residential project, uh, Albert Subdivision, which was off of uh, Auburn Road uh, mm -hmm. in the northern part of town. Uh, another extension for Phase 5 of the Buttrick Professional Office uh, project uh, next door to Mr. Steer. Uh, then we have a reaffirmation of approval and extension request for Benson's Lumber uh, for a millwork building. Uh, that's actually a project that was approved uh, almost five years ago. Uh, has received several extensions and uh, they're now getting to the point where they're ready to move forward with the project. Uh, however, it did lapse, so the board needs to take action to uh, reinstate that approval. Uh, the next item is something we don't do that often, but uh, does come up from time to time. We have a request uh, from the Manchester Airport Authority uh, for a governmental land use request. Uh, in this case, it's the Aviation Museum that's looking at doing a new uh, learning center addition to the uh, museum facility. Oh, that'd uh, be great. The, the plan that uh, will be presented to the board uh, shows uh, an addition uh, next door to the existing Aviation Museum, which, as people may know, used to be the former terminal building at the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also have an elevation drawing as to what that's going to look like. Uh, so it'll be basically located behind the, uh, the existing museum facility, uh, right adjacent to the runway at the airport on Kelly Road. Uh, what the board will be doing with this on the 12th is uh, determining whether or not the board wants to hold a public hearing on this. Uh, the statute that governs uh, governmental land use basically allows the board the option of holding a mm -hmm. public hearing. If the board chooses a public hearing, uh, the board can then uh, comment on the project as it would for any other project. However, the comments of the board will be non-binding in mm -hmm. those situations. So is that a water tower or is it a that's, silo like? That is actually the existing, uh, that's existing today. Uh, this part of the building that I'm circling on the existing building was part of the original terminal building. It's a uh, small tower uh, that uh, was glass encased. Uh, I don't know if it used to be the, the old tower for the FAA mm -hmm. or what it might have been back in the days when that was still the terminal. Uh, but that is part of the, uh, the original building. Uh, the new cool. addition is uh, the large building you see in the back mm -hmm. uh, that will be uh, constructed as an addition to the existing facility. Well, that's exciting that the airport is doing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I know that school children in our town have taken advantage of going up there and mm -hmm. doing tours, so. Yeah, this, this will allow them some additional classroom space and areas mm -hmm. to do activities with children and classes that come in. That's great. Uh, it'll allow them to better utilize the space they have up there. Good. Other than that, we have the, the really typical general uh, administrative board work with our minutes, uh, going through a couple of regional impact determinations and then discussions with town staff. One of the items we're gonna be discussing with town staff is actually a, uh, deals with the Mr. Steer uh, project. The owner of Mr. Steer has actually come to the town looking at, uh, because of the success of the, uh, the building and the, the cafe that they've had, uh, they have run out of space for cooler space. Uh -huh. uh, so they were going to be coming into the board to ask some direction on what to do with a small 8x10 uh, enclosure for an outdoor cooler. Uh, they're proposing it to be on the side of the building, or the front if you were looking at the building from Buttrick Road, the rear if you're looking at it from 102. Uh, so that will be something the board will be asking the board direction on mm -hmm. as to whether or not it needs to go through the full uh, formal review process or if it's something the board's comfortable with staff handling administratively. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're certainly encouraged and glad that uh, the business is working well. And Yeah, I'm glad the business is doing well too, but do we allow for outside storage? We do, uh, It's as long as it's screened and that's the, the main reason for the uh, enclosure with the stockade fence, which if I scroll down the plan here, uh, and zoom out a little Can bit. I see the, the fence. Uh, would be complete, completely enclosed in an 8x10 enclosure for the mm -hmm. freezer with a gate on the side, uh, but it would be uh, in, in keeping with the, the aesthetic of the building, mm -hmm. I think. Well, they did a beautiful job when they built those buildings, and I'm glad to see that they're yep. successful. It'll be good. So then we get into... Uh, the first item on the agenda is actually something the board has seen before. Uh, it's a two-lot subdivision off of Diana Road. Uh, this is a project that has already received conditional approval from the planning board. Uh, however, in the uh, addressing of the conditions of approval, uh, there has been a substantive change to the plans mm -hmm. which requires a public hearing before the plan can be signed. Uh, we're talking about the lot that's on the corner of Apollo and Diana. 
uh, in the development off of Route 102 uh, heading towards Hudson. Uh, and the aerial photographs gives you a little better idea. If the board recalls, uh, and the viewers may recall, um, Diana Road curves into uh, Apollo Road and there's a paper right-of-way uh, for an unimproved portion of the street mm -hmm. that uh, they were able to obtain a variance from the zoning board to allow for the development of an additional lot. Part of that included uh, creating a driveway access into the new lot that they're creating, making sure that it meets the requirements of the fire department and all our public services. Uh, in doing that review, because the, uh, the change to that roadway at the discretion of the public works department and the fire department is larger than was presented to the planning board, it needs to come back to the board for a public hearing before the board can give final approval for the project. So anyone who has any interest in that particular thing mm -hmm. should come and speak at Absolutely. this time. Yep. That's the reason, yeah. because it is a substantive change, mm -hmm. it's not administrative in nature, uh, that's why the statute requires that those types of things come back to the planning board mm -hmm. and allows for public input before the approvals are finally given. So all of the abutters would have been notified they of this? They have all been re-notified of this, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Uh, the next item is a rezoning uh, request, uh, conceptual discussion. This is a small lot up in the North Village area. Um, probably if um, this is Route 28 uh, heading from the Triangle. This is the section of Mammoth Road heading into the North Village. Mm -hmm. um, off of that is Weymouth Road and there's a small piece of property that uh, is currently zoned commercial, uh, but is surrounded on three sides by residential and industrial uh, to the south. Uh, what the property owner uh, is looking to do on that particular property is have it rezoned back to residential. Mm -hmm. uh, he plans on building a, a home on the lot. Uh, we, from what we can gather from our research, uh, there used to be a commercial structure on that lot, which is why it was zoned commercial back in the 1960s when zoning was established in Londonderry. So this is actually more uh, in line with the surrounding uses and uh, they'll be asking for the board's feedback before they move forward with a public hearing to change that to residential. Now when you've had something that was commercial on a residential lot mm -hmm. or a lot that's surrounded by residential, mm -hmm. before um, they can build anything, they'd have to do soil samples and make sure that the land is for you know, commercial healthy. use, yes. Uh, for residential use, the, the soils are determined for lot sizing where you don't have access to municipal sewer. And in those situations, the, the lot size that's required for a residential home is based on the carrying capacity of that soil to handle a septic system. So that's how our soils-based lot sizing works. Uh, it, generally speaking, the lot sizes end up between an acre and two acres, depending mm -hmm. on the, uh, how good the soils are. Uh, in this situation, uh, the lot uh, is more than adequate. I believe it's almost uh, two acres. And is there, um, does it need septic or is there? This would be on septic, I believe. Uh, they, all the existing homes in the area are on septic. Um, so it's just buyer beware though. I mean, if somebody is. was gonna build a house, they would mm -hmm. wanna make sure that they had the, the water yeah, tested the, and everything else. The person that's doing this actually owns the house immediately to the west of it <laughs> and uh, is living with his mother and in order to make things more mm -hmm. accommodating for the, the home situation. He's looking to put a smaller home on that lot mm -hmm. to accommodate both his family and his mother's family. I see. Okay. Well, I, you know, I mean, if I were uh, somebody coming in and going to buy this lot, mm -hmm. any lot, any, I, lot. any lot in Londonderry mm -hmm. or anywhere, you just want to make sure you so, ask these types of questions. Absolutely. And go to your planning department. And, and we keep all of those plans right. and information for all the subdivisions that have been approved in town on mm -hmm. record. Uh, so a lot of times uh, the general information that people are looking for can be easily found by spending a few minutes in the office and mm -hmm. looking through the files and the plans that we have archived. Absolutely. Good. Uh, next up is a conceptual discussion from Eric Chinberg of Chinberg Builders. Uh, this is for a lot uh, off of Old Dairy Road. Um, it's a very large parcel. It's over 240 acres. Uh, this lot currently is, again, off of Old Dairy Road. It's split zone today, both residential and industrial. Mm -hmm. uh, the industrial area that this is adjacent to is where uh, the waste management facility is off of uh, Liberty Drive. Okay. Uh, the Camco uh, building materials facility is at the end of uh, Independence. Mm -hmm. uh, so all that area to the south of this is uh, very developed uh, industrial property. But all the area to the north of this is uh, all zoned residential. Uh, the, the person interested in this is looking at doing uh, moderately priced homes. He's not looking to utilize our workforce housing ordinance mm -hmm. at this time, uh, but he's been very successful in other parts of the state in doing uh, 
more affordable, moderately priced homes. Uh, so he's looking at doing a potential conservation subdivision, which would be the first since we've adopted that ordinance a couple of years ago, cool. uh, utilizing and protecting open space as well as clustering mm -hmm. the homes uh, on smaller lot sizes, but in exchange protecting a large portion right. of this property. So when you say a moderately priced home, do you want to venture a guess? I would guess he's probably looking somewhere in the, the low to mid 200 range mm -hmm. for a single family home. Okay. Um, Again, I, I think we'll have more detail in his presentation that he mm -hmm. gives the board, but I do know that he's been working uh, with, the with an engineer, uh, starting to do some of the preliminary work to see what this uh, parcel can potentially yield in terms of residential development. Uh, because of the split zoning of the lot, uh, the, there is some conflict in terms of how our zoning is structured and right. what would be permitted. So part of his discussion is also going to be talking with the planning board about potentially uh, either moving the industrial zoning line further to the south or just rezoning the entirety of the parcel residential. Uh, the reason uh, staff isn't really as concerned about losing industrial land in this particular location is that it's landlocked, it's got a significant amount of wetland, uh, and there's actually a large conservation easement already on the Camco piece mm -hmm. that uh, prevents getting further access into the property. But it's a very large, relatively pristine, uh, uh, wooded uh, with scattered wetlands throughout the property. Uh, it's, it's a property that's uh, been in conversations uh, with the different uh, developers and property owners and conservationists for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're encouraged that uh, this potentially could be not a full step towards workforce housing, but something that may provide right. some additional housing options here right. in Londonderry. Now, the only reason I'm asking this is because of all of the flooding that we had recently mm -hmm. in Londonderry. And now, when you take an area that's wooded mm -hmm. and you cut down those trees and you build houses, mm -hmm. you're changing the, the water table in the area. I mean, do we have any concerns? Any concerns that we do have uh, that get discovered during the review process are things that we'll be reviewing. Again, we use, utilize services of professional engineers mm -hmm. on staff as well as our consultants uh, that will review and make sure that any uh, development on this piece is going to be compliant, safe with all of our ordinances and regulations. Uh, so I think that given the level of detail that we go into in our regulations mm -hmm. today, we're in a better position to prevent those types of things from happening in the future. So things like retention ponds or, mm -hmm. or I don't know, streams? I, I don't know because yeah. I'm not an engineer. All but there those would types be of things are going to be accounted for. Uh, the way our uh, regulations work is the rate of runoff as it is today is a purely wooded site. Whatever the rate of runoff is today has to be the same after the property is mm -hmm. developed. So they're going to have to manage the impacts of changing the topography, changing uh, the impervious surfaces on the uh, site to make sure that that drainage and that water is all accounted for. Okay, because, uh, you know, and it's not necessarily that I'm concerned about the site mm -hmm. itself. I'm concerned it's about the, the neighbors. Absolutely. You know. And that's the reason why our regulations are the way they are, is to make sure that whatever people see now should be the same or less in the future. Okay. All right. Well, and I know you're on top of that. I just wanted to bring Absolutely. that out. Uh, and then next, uh, we have the, the culmination of our about six uh, to eight months worth of work on the zoning changes to Exit 5. Mm -hmm. um, the, t what we're calling the mixed-use commercial district. Um, <clears throat> it would basically establish a new sub-district in our commercial district uh, for mixed-use commercial development. Uh, would allow a variety of different uses, uh, such as uh, assisted living facilities, uh, mixed-use residential, uh, cultural and performing arts, uh, business center, convention centers, adult daycare, uh, financial institutions, education and training, uh, retail development, uh, two different levels, one mm -hmm. with an additional level of scrutiny for the planning board with a conditional use permit, uh, professional office. Uh, so it's trying to get a mix of mm -hmm. what we think is the appropriate type of uh, uses for that exit five area. Uh, so we're going to be reorganizing our commercial district into five new sub-districts. And as part of this process, we're going to be reorganizing the commercial district so it's a little bit more readable, a little bit more user-friendly, uh, get the standards in a more logical and readable fashion so that it's a little bit easier for both staff to interpret as well as developers and property owners mm -hmm. to understand as they move forward through the... So even though this is spearheaded because of the Exit 5 area, this is going to encompass the whole town? Uh, this is actually, no. This the, no? When we get to... Uh, skip forward a little bit here. I mean the reorganization of the commercial and Of the commercial district, it, it, it won't impact how people are zoned, it'll just reorganize right. how, the, how the regulations are organized. Uh, but the area that we're talking about is uh, the area immediately to the west of Exit 5, mm -hmm. 
these parcels are currently in our Route uh, 28 performance overlay district. Uh, if the board were to move forward with this and the council adopt it, they would be taken out of the POD, changed into this mixed-use commercial district. So it would include those lots uh, with frontage on Rockingham Road, basically from Exit 5 to Sims Drive and Vista Ridge Drive, with the exception of the two most uh, adjacent lots on the west side of Vista Ridge Drive that were added primarily because uh, we've lost uh, map 15, lot 56, which mm -hmm. is immediately adjacent to the exit, uh, which the state is actually going to be purchasing for a possible future expansion of the park and ride. Mm -hmm. So with that loss of potential tax base, the planning board opted to include these other two lots to try to make up for some of that uh, uh, revenue, po potential revenue and development that we would lose on that particular property. So why would you, why would we remove a POD and then put something on it? You know, why wouldn't we just remove, what, aren't we, what's the point? It's, it's part of the point is it's going forward, moving forward with the recommendations that came from our Northwest Small Area Master Plan, uh, which was about nine to ten months worth of work uh, examining not only this section of town but all of Northwest Londonderry. And the, the recommendations that came out of that plan through various public workshops and meetings with the Planning Board and uh, Southern Hampshire Planning Commission was that this is a unique area that needed something a little bit different than mm -hmm. what we're doing elsewhere. So rather than uh, completely reinvent the wheel, we've tried to modify right. our existing districts to try to capture those recommendations from the planning board mm -hmm. and from that plan itself. Um, so really it is an encouraging, a way to encourage more it's, it's, development. It's a way to encourage more development and more responsible development right. without uh, completely uh, hamstringing developers' uh, hands with some of the, the more onerous performance mm -hmm. standards that are in our current mm -hmm. performance overlay district. Okay. Uh, but again, uh, it looks at a variety of different uses, including some that would be uh, through a conditional use permit, uh, which adds an extra level of scrutiny from the planning board. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some performance-based setback requirements that we'll be talking about, uh, buffering, uh, as well as the ability by the planning board to waive some of the uh, dimensional requirements of the ordinance by conditional use permit, right. eliminating the need for variances potentially from applicants. Uh, so that allows the planning board and the applicants some flexibility to try to come up with the most appropriate design for these types of projects. So we're not giving away the store, though? Absolutely not. But we are trying to make it a little bit more friendly. More, a little bit more business friendly, mm -hmm. a little bit more user friendly, uh, trying to uh, encourage responsible economic development, which again mm -hmm. is probably the top goal of the town council right. uh, for this uh, upcoming year. Uh, the last item is a, another workshop discussion talking about the number of units that would be allowed in multifamily buildings, uh, primarily related to the workforce housing ordinance. Uh, what we've done is we've taken a look at the cost impacts of uh, change from 24 units per building to 16 units per building. Uh, we've utilized uh, the services of uh, Greater Manchester NeighborWorks, which is a nonprofit mm -hmm. uh, developer and uh, affordable housing advocate that have done uh, different projects in and around Londonderry, but not in Londonderry. We tried to utilize somebody who's not working in Londonderry currently that mm -hmm. would benefit from uh, changing the numbers right. to their favor, right. somebody who's non-profit. Uh, we thought that was probably the most unbiased way to try mm -hmm. to come up with some ideas. Uh, what we found is is that we really need to focus on what the building costs are because from site to site, the site costs are so variable, right. it would be really impossible for us to determine what the cost impact of that change would be from site to site. But uh, ultimately, uh, what we'll be uh, presenting to the planning board is that the, the change from 24 to 16 units it represents about a 10% increase in the cost of the buildings themselves. Mm -hmm. And it'll be up to the planning board to determine whether or not that's significant enough to either change the ordinance or not change the ordinance. Right. And you wouldn't want an ordinance that would say 16 to 24 per unit, no, right? No, it's, you'd want, you'd want to have something consistent. Specific. And if the board does opt to make the change, we will also be looking at our R3 district and our elderly housing right. ordinance to make sure it's consistent across the board right. so there's equal protection for everybody who does mm -hmm. multifamily in town. And there must be a difference in the cost in building those, though. There, there, it's, it, a little bit. A lot of it depends on the style of building, whether you're doing um, affordable housing mm -hmm. or if you're doing more luxury style development. But when we look at efficiencies of scale, doing more units per building is more efficient for the builder to do than right. to have them separated into separate buildings. And of course, there's additional impacts in terms of you know, more driveways, more access, additional drainage, more impervious surface. So mm -hmm. there are costs associated with that that intuitively we know we're going to increase, but we just don't know how they're going to increase right. from site to site. Right. And that will pretty much do it for right. uh, the May 12th meeting. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking well, the you. time to come, and we'll see you in June. We will. And uh, just the last thing uh, for viewers uh, of the program, 
Uh, I'd ask Mary if I could get in a Absolutely. quick cheap plug. Uh, <laughs> the London Dairy Joint Loss Management Committee is uh, putting together a uh, 5K walk for autism uh, that's going to be on Sunday, May 16th at 1 o'clock, starting at the Moose Hill Orchard, uh, excuse me, the Moose Hill Kindergarten. Uh, it's a 5K walk through the, uh, the Apple Orchards. Uh, all the proceeds are going to uh, uh, benefit the Autism Society of New Hampshire. And being a parent of a child with autism, uh, I certainly would welcome those people that are interested to show up, walk, and uh, donate to the Autism Society. It's a, so it's a charity that's very near and dear to my heart mm -hmm. and has uh, been very helpful to me and my family. Right, and you know, I've had firsthand experience working with autistic children as a special educator in our, in our school district. And I know that early intervention really makes it a huge difference does. for these students. So anything that, you know, this, this program can mm -hmm. um, accomplish will be helpful. It will be. And it'll also save us in taxes in the long run because, you know, the services that they need will not be as sure. intense as it, as it has been. Yep. You know, it's great that there's, that autism is becoming a household name, you know what I mean? That people is, are starting to learn it about is, it. And unfortunately, the rates are also increasing. Right. So. But you know what? There probably were many students yeah, that, were had, that were autistic and they just didn't have that name. Yep, you know? I agree. So it, it's, a, it's with anything. I mean, it's with anything. It is. You know, once you, <laughs> the more you, knowledge you have, the more you're going to be able Absolutely. to pinpoint what it is. So, yeah. well, again, thank, thank you very you. much, Tim, and thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next month.